Greetings, I'm Pastor Mike, and this is another Scripture Discovery episode. We are doing a topical series for these next couple of weeks before we move into our Christmas series, and we're covering the topic gratitude and thanksgiving. So last week, we covered 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15, and this is concerning giving. And if you look at the passage, you see that Paul was concerned about the heart and attitude when it comes to giving, and not necessarily about how much you give. Also in that passage, there's a lot tied in with thanksgiving. And as you give what God has given you, it actually brings glory to God. And I think the heart of the whole passage was, as God gives to you, and you give freely to others, it gives glory to God. So if you haven't seen the episode or have taken a look at that passage, I would encourage you to do so. This week we are covering Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And even though we're only covering six verses, Paul has a lot to say that's really challenging As I was reading through this before starting the video, I was challenged by what I see as Paul's loving exhortation to the Philippian church. And I know for myself, just with the many challenges as we draw near to the holidays and COVID cases are on the rise in Michigan, I found this passage convicting and challenging me on not just what to do, but more specifically, how to think and what I should be focused on in life. So with that, make sure you have the passage in front of you. Print it out if you'd like, grab a pencil and highlighter, and let's dive into this passage. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. All right, starting right out of the blocks. Rejoice. This is a command that he's giving. We are to rejoice in the Lord always. And you always want to take note when you see Paul using words like always or all, every. These emphatic words that are all-inclusive or the words that he uses that are all exclusive. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul here is repeating himself, so let's make that connection. Paul is emphasizing rejoicing. All right, verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Now that word reasonableness is an interesting word. I'm not quite sure how many times we see that word reasonableness in the New Testament, but I did look up the Greek word And it can also mean gentleness and kindness. And I think that there are other translations that translate it as gentleness. And I think I like that translation better. Reasonableness comes off more as agreeable or a little more stoic, whereas gentleness and kindness has the nuance of relationship with it. All right, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Let's circle everyone. And then the Lord is at hand. What does that phrase mean? I'm not aware of any other place in the New Testament that uses this phrase, the Lord is at hand. 
we've heard the kingdom is at hand or the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus says that often. And I think what Paul is saying is that the Lord is near. He is with us. And this makes sense as we look at verse 6. Do not be anxious. So that would be another command. Now notice that I didn't highlight let your reasonableness be known. It's because I'm making a distinction between the direct commands that Paul gives compared to the strong exhortations or the strong encouragements that he's giving. So in verse 5, this is probably written in Greek as a subjunctive. And what tells me that is the word let. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Now, I'm not saying that Paul is merely suggesting this. All I'm pointing out is in the grammar, it's not as direct as verse 4 and verse 6. All right, back to verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Again, it's all-inclusive. Always rejoice. Let everyone see how gentle or reasonable you are. And do not be anxious about anything. But, here's a contrast, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, here it is, let your requests be made known to God. Let's circle everything. And notice that Paul is describing two practices. What are they? Prayer and supplication. Now, we can also ask the question, what does Paul mean by supplication? And I did look up that word in Greek, and it can also mean plea or request or petition. So, by prayer and petition or pleading, and notice how we are to pray and bring our requests. It is with thanksgiving. Now, I'm going to circle that yellow instead of highlighting it, because it isn't a direct command. But this is the kind of heart that we are to have when we pray and make our requests. Paul again uses the word let. Let your requests be made known to God. I think I'm going to circle requests, make it this pink color. Now, this word is different than the word supplication in Greek. But of course, they're translating it requests. And I think it's just including both prayer and supplication. And I'm also going to highlight, be made known to God. And I'm highlighting this because we know that God already knows what we need and what we want. He knows our prayers before we even speak them. He knows everything. But what Paul is saying here is that we need to, in some ways communicate our prayers and requests and pleas and petitions to our God. God wants a relationship with us. And how can there be a relationship if there's only one way of communication? If we are only receiving his word, hearing his word, and we do not respond back in some way, what kind of relationship is that? I think we know from human relationships that that kind of one-way communication would not be healthy in a relationship. All right, verse 7, and, so verse 7 is connecting back to verse 6, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Now, we definitely have to underline the peace of God. And I'm going to highlight the phrase, will guard. So what will guard us? It is the peace of God, which, by the way, it surpasses all understanding. This is something that we cannot comprehend. But it will guard specifically our hearts and our minds in Jesus Christ. That phrase, in Jesus Christ, always baffles me. And I'm trying to figure out what it means in this verse. It looks as though there's definitely a connection between the peace of God and Jesus Christ. So the peace of God will guard us. It'll guard us 
in Jesus Christ. All right, verse 8, finally. Sounds like Paul is wrapping things up, making his final exhortation. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, all right, here's the command, think, think about these things. Notice the word, whatever. I think I'm going to have to mark those just to be consistent. Verses 4, 5, and 6, I was marking the emphatics. And in verse 8, we see it in repetition. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. Notice that Paul changes gears. Now he is using a condition. If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise. And I'm also going to circle the word any and the word anything. So he's still using this inclusive language. I'm also going to circle think. Think about these things. And notice in verse 7, what is God guarding? It's our hearts and our minds. I believe that's a connection. So God will guard our hearts and minds, but there's something that we need to do as well. And that is set our minds on things that are godly. I believe that's basically the summary of verse 8. So I'm wondering if we can summarize this whole section in Philippians as the battle for our minds. Now, maybe it's not a summary of the whole passage, verses 4 through 9, but verses 7 and 8 is specifically talking about the importance of our thought life. Now, I'm also going to circle the word commendable in verse 8 and the phrase worthy of praise. I believe those words are very similar to one another. You see an action that is very commendable. It's something that you highly respect or are grateful for. Maybe you can even describe it as something that is praiseworthy. And I'm wondering if we can even circle the word honorable and excellent, but I think I'll just keep it to these two words. Now, the reason why I circle those two words is because it reminds me of what we saw in verses 4 and 6. The command to rejoice in verse 4. And in verse 6, the way that we are to pray and make our requests, it's with thanksgiving. So it's praise, rejoicing, thanksgiving to God. And in verse 8, of course, we know that he is worthy of praise. And I might be stretching it a little bit with the word commendable, but in my mind, that word has something to do with voicing some type of thankfulness or praise in some way. All right, last verse, verse 9. What you have learned, I'm going to highlight that, and received and heard and seen in me. And here we have the command, practice these things. And in verse 9 here again we see the phrase, God of peace. The God of peace will be with you. And I'm going to highlight that phrase as well. So I believe there's a connection with verse 7 and 9, that phrase, God of peace, and specifically what the God of peace will do. It will guard you, and it will be with you, here in verse 9. So I'm making that connection as well. Oh, and by the way, I'm not trying to reveal some type of hidden meaning in verses 7 and 9 with this triangle, okay? This is not referring to the Trinity, and that is definitely not the way we are to study Scripture. So no conspiracy comments on our YouTube page. But seriously, notice the connections 
with 7 and 9. And I think I want to go back to verse 8 and look at the command to think. I wish that there was another way to highlight that word without making it too messy, because I think it's really important in the whole context. But also the word practice in verse 9. Because I think we can make the argument that Paul is calling us to practice all these things that he just mentioned. Let me make this connection first. In verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen, all four of those verbs, refers back to Paul. So what you have learned from Paul, received from Paul, heard from him, and seen in him, it all goes back to Paul. That's why I believe it includes everything that he just mentioned in verses 4 through 9. So what have we learned? What have we received and heard and seen from Paul and his example? Well, Starting in verse 4, what are we to put into practice? Rejoicing. In verse 5, your gentleness or reasonableness be seen by others. Verse 6, do not be anxious. And prayer and supplication and doing that with thanksgiving, that is what we are to practice. Now verse 7 is more of a promise or condition when we do these things, when we pray with thanksgiving, making our requests known to God, the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds. So that's something we don't necessarily practice. So I'm going to skip over that. But in verse 8, there are all sorts of things that we are to think about. So that's the practice, is thinking about these things which I would suggest causes us to rejoice and to pray with thanksgiving. When we set our minds on things that are godly, it completely changes the way that we think. It wills up within us praise, honor, and glory to God with thankfulness. And of course, verses 4, 5, 6, and 8 are rooted in verse 9, specifically in the command to practice. Again, this passage has really convicted me and encouraged me to, in my own life, practice what Paul is teaching here. My mind goes in so many different directions throughout the day, and I know that even turning on the TV and watching the news or going on social media does not help me think about those things that are godly in verse 8. In fact, much of it makes me anxious. And in verse 6, it tells us to not be anxious about anything. So again, that really spoke to me. Oh, and by the way, let me close by giving you a homework assignment. Get out a notebook or Just get a sheet of paper out or use your journal even and put these words into columns. So one column would be whatever is true. The next column would be honorable and then just and pure and so on and so on. All the words that you see in verse 8 that we are to think about. So put those into columns and then take some time praying to the Lord and thinking through what are the truths that I should be thinking about and write those things down. You know, God's promises are true. What are those promises? And then do the same thing with whatever is honorable. Spend some time with the Lord. What are those things that are honorable that you could be thinking about? And go throughout the whole passage, whatever is just and pure and lovely and commendable, anything that's excellent and anything that is worthy of praise. List those things out and then take some time praying to the Lord, praising him for what he has given you. And then take some time practicing verse 6 
specifically through prayer and supplication. So even in your requests, with a heart of thanksgiving, give those things to the Lord. Make them known to him. All right, I think that about does it for our time together this week. Next week, we will be finishing up this series and then moving into our Christmas series. I hope you find this helpful, and we'll see you next week.